Mr. Hello? Cherry, can you hear me all right? Hello? Oh, I've got you on. Uh... Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. All right, let me just pull this and go back to, hopefully this will be no problem. I had you set up through the stereo, so I'm just putting you back to audio on my computer. Can you hear me all right now? So, oh, there we go. Oh, I'll get you. Man, do you look like your father. I know. So they say I look like my dad, but I act like my mom. Well, you as you get older, you probably look more like him. I don't know. I haven't seen your face for a while, so uh, glad, thank you for this, first of all. And I, I got to start. We're recording already, so this is part of it, and I appreciate okay. the time. Let me start with a confession. Okay. I, um, I'm a uh, resigned and cynical 25-year realtor in Niagara. Apparently, Jerry Cheevers used to baby uh, used to get babysat by my grandmother, Goulet, oh, yeah. my dad's uh, mother. <clears throat> I'm chasing Jerry down to see if he'll give me some time too. I wrote him a letter when I was a kid because we had all the addresses as kids, so we used to write everyone letters. And I wrote, and I was all bummed that Jerry didn't get back to me because I thought I had a special connection with him. Anyway, so I'm a resigned and cynical 25-year realtor in Niagara. I've had a couple radio gigs over the last. I don't know, 10 or 15 years, 20 years maybe. Uh, and then um, I'm no longer on the radio. We don't need to get into that story. Um, so I've been doing YouTubing. Yeah. And I feel like, a, I don't know, I don't want to compare myself to your father, but he seems like a guy that just says it because it needs to be said and he's not too concerned with the fallout. I've been like that for a long time. I, I'm a seven time Green Party candidate. You know, I'm not as left as I used to be. I'm more center right now is I think with age comes wisdom. And so for the last couple of years, I've been working on this YouTube channel. It's a 10 year old channel, but for the last couple of years, I've been actually spending some time making some effort. And when your dad got fired, I clipped him and Tucker Carlson. I've grown to really enjoy Tucker Carlson. I mean, yeah. whether you like his politics or his takes or not, he's a gr one of the best broadcasters. Like he never makes a mistake. Yeah. And because I'm a critic, naturally I see this. So um, I woke up in the morning and this interview with your dad had exploded to over anything I've ever done on YouTube before. I didn't know. I just, I love Don Cherry. We grew up with them. The hockey night in Canada themes drilled in my head. I can smell the popcorn. I can taste the Pepsi. I can see my dad and his orange lazy boy over there. As a kid, it was just, a, it was a religious experience in my home. Every Saturday night he watched and he had Sabres tickets. He would go on the regular and my dad like your dad probably is an old school like when you heard the lazy boy like when you're in trouble and you heard the lazy boy kick you you, you there was respect there was fear you knew he was getting up you better straighten your act up mom we ran all over she was a really soft lady and um so i'm like okay so all right well this is good and then the first podcast you guys did, I clipped the five minute segment where you talked about Ron and hockey night or Rogers and, and whatever. I yeah. put it up and it blew up. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I was stuck at 200 subs, mm -hmm. no monetization um, opportunity there because you need a thousand. I never thought I would get there. Yeah. I, it wasn't my plan to become a YouTube star, but I just, I just use it as a platform. Well then, and you're, that little clip of Don and talking with you and Cindy on the podcast, like it, yeah. it, it did very well. Right. So yeah. I started carrying it and I, I, I could see people going, Hey, what do you do? Like, so, I, I mean, I, I haven't done today's, but faithfully I get up first thing Monday morning, Thursday mornings, and I clip it and I put it on my channel. With the idea that I love grapes, everyone loves grapes, lots of people are looking at it, but yeah. then the subs started going through the roof. So I owe probably my last couple checks. You know, the fact that I monetized to your family and Don specifically and the generosity of, well, yeah, I mean, it's not like I asked permission, ask for forgiveness later is, you know, <laughs> probably something you've heard before. Um, with the idea that, hey, you know what, the, this man's going to have a hard time getting his takes out there I, i'm sure he's not it's not it's not a yeah. income stream for him but i just wanted to start off by saying if you haven't known this already because the clips are all over youtube and, and my ranking's pretty high on it because lots of like like it's been 
really slowing down. And since then, since I've been monetized, I had a couple videos go to seven, 800,000. So those ones are making me money. I'm not making money off the podcast. Don's yeah. podcast well, so much. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you promoting it. You know, every little bit helps. Yeah. Well, uh, I feel like I'm a little indebted to you. I, I've been chasing you down and I thought, you know what? I, the first thing I got to do is come correct with the man right off the bat and admit that I've been <laughs> stealing his stuff all this time and actually making money from it. So, uh, thank you very much for your time. I'm a huge fan. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I just, I wanted to hit you up and, uh, might as well talk, let's get the dark stuff out right off the bat. You okay. mentioned, you know, you're the kind of new to social media and you're having a new yeah. experience. I, I certainly want to talk about the podcast, what it was like growing up with in the cherry family. I think I have an idea, but uh, just a more, it's like I said to you offline, a more personal, uh, less polit I mean, I'm all about politics. I'm sure we can talk about the cancel culture. I know he's, he's been really frustrated by that, but tell me about your recent experience on social media and and the darkness of it or are you enjoying it actually well you know it's just been an eye opener for me because you know I, you know i'm 56 so you know i just been dabbling with social media before the whole poppy gate thing i had a facebook page and you know i had some hockey stuff and some movie stuff on and then you know when the, everything happened with dad i kind of took over his twitter feed and uh, was helping him with it and it, it is a it, it it amazed me how many trolls there are on there, I guess, and, and how that they follow, <laughs> yeah, how they follow dad and anything that he puts up, they'll just, you know, call him a racist or a bigot or xenophobic or homophobic and everything. And I, I, I was a little bit shocked by that because, and I have a little bit of a new kind of respect what my daughter, who's 22, kind of what she went going through through high school and, and through college if that's kind of the norm um because i was never you know i think facebook's well uh now that i'm into it a little bit more and, and understanding facebook is an older uh, you know an older platform for for older people um but you know i was never into instagram or twitter or snapchat or whatever so it really was an eye opener um and not that it bothers me i mean you know uh, I, I just shake my head of what kind of person, you know, follows a person so that he can write nasty things about him when he tweets something out. Um, I think that's kind of the biggest revelation for me, really. I mean, it was, it, it really was a bit, a, a real eye opener, actually. Yeah. And it seems so easy to hide behind your keyboard. I think why well, I'd liken it to being behind your steering wheel. I used to suffer from road, road rage, but I also used to subscribe to the idea that time is money. So I was impatient and yeah. uh, where I had to go was much more important than where you had to go because it's me. And mm -hmm. I, I gave that up, but time is not money actually. And my yeah. clients appreciate that, especially in real estate. Um, and I think it's similar to being behind your keyboard, you're faceless, many are anonymous. Yeah. And I see the similar to, the Trump derangement syndrome in the States where the man can't do anything right. He just right. closed the borders for air travel out of Europe and they're still squawking. We, you need to stay you know, state of emergency. Uh, Bernie was just on saying, this is what I would do. Like yeah. he can't do anything right because all they want to do, like Bill Maher talking on his show about wishing for a recession so they could blame the failure on Trump. Right. They, yeah. they just get ideologically possessed. So it doesn't matter and I saw an interview with your dad with CBC or Global, I think it was. And she asked him, are you a racist? And I was like, oh, I wish he had just said, are you, come, no, I'm not. Because here's the deal. Here's how you tell if someone's a racist, unless their actions prove different. And we come from different, you know, and I'm not making any excuses for Don Cherry. He doesn't need me to defend him. But I know what it's like when you're a broadcaster. When that red light is on, not everything comes out perfect. Yeah. And as a result of that pressure, you mix up your words, you say things that didn't go, come out right or what have you. But this idea that when you ask a man, are you racist? Do you, yeah. Are you homophobic? Do you have xenophobia against strange looking people? Which I, I, I think runs very deep in our DNA since we were cave dwellers. We right. feared the other color. We feared the other 
the language. We didn't have tea and sex with them and start families. We tried to annihilate them. So I think there's a long line of kind of tribalism. Yeah. And so, but well, these it, people, it's funny, like with, with, um, and I, I kind of noticed this with dad and it, I think started a while ago is that there's no kind of gray area. It's either extreme right or extreme left or extreme one. And, you know, you look at, I remember dad was really criticized when he um, was uh, criticizing P.K. Subban, who played for Montreal, who was, uh, was a black hockey player, if you don't know. Yeah. And, you know, immediately, oh, you're, Don Cherry's doing that because P.K. Subban's black and that he's, uh, it, you know, and, and, you know, that went on all over the internet. There was even people in the, the mainstream media said it. But, you know, they failed to say that dad said the same thing about Sidney Crosby, about Mary Lemieux. And, um, and then what happened was then dad, you know, when the, the Olympics ha happened, uh, uh, they weren't going to take PK Subban. If you remember, Babcock didn't want him. And dad came on and said, you know, he has to make the team. He's, you know, he's a, uh, you know, he's a Norris trophy winner. He, he's got a, you know, he should be on the team. And it's amazing that again, that the, if people were calling that a racist, they never brought that up that Don Cherry stuck up for P.K. Subban. And dad and P.K. Subban are friends. They shake hands every time they see each other. Dad has known him since he's been 15 years old. We go, went out and watched him when he played minor midget. Um, so, or they would say, well, Don Cherry's just saying that. So um, he's, uh, you know, proven that he's not a racist. So there's always this, there, there's never kind of, well, if you say this about somebody, that means you never were going to like them. If you criticize them, that means they're never any good. If you praise them, you can never say anything bad about them. And I mean, it's even with dad saying, oh, you know, Don Cherry doesn't like uh, foreign hockey players. Well, over the last three years, he says the greatest goalie in the league is Frederick Anderson, who's, who's uh, I don't know, if he, I think he's Finnish or Swedish. Great. But again, the people that, if that doesn't fit their narrative, they won't talk about that. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to, to sit back and see that, how that's, how that plays out um, not only with that, but with just almost anybody in the media now or anybody in the public eye. Who did he kiss on? Uh, I know he's kissed like he kissed many guys, but was, you know, after he got fired from Sportsnet, I know there was clips that came up and were like, racist, look, he kissed this kid. Who was the, was it Zuban or who was um, some kid? And yeah, I remember yeah. them saying, see, he just he kissed him just like he loves Dougie Gilmore. And yeah. he was the white kid. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and again, that's the thing that i I find surprisingly that when and again seeing it with dad is that if um uh, you know, once you say something about somebody or something that you can't go back and praise them because you said something bad, therefore you don't like any everything about him. And it's kind of like what's going on in the politics in, in the United States and even the politics in Canada. I mean, there's people who, you know, Trudeau can do nothing wrong. And there's people who say, could, you know, he's done nothing right. Well, I and wish they could find something he did right. But yeah, but I'm looking, for, I'm looking for a way. I'm looking to cheer him on. I was really hopeful when he came in, but really disappointed. And like I said, I, I've, I've gone from left, pretty far left as a green party. I mean, it doesn't get much more left than that unless you go communism. Uh, to center right and the left kind of left me uh, you know when it comes to free speech number one is free speech for me yeah. two I think there's a religious question that the Christians the Jews and the Islamics uh, the Muslims need to have uh, to know that you know we can live together in peace and that one's not trying to wipe the other off the planet and then there's the guns issue and the left is all wrong on those issues for me and you know, when they were talking about making Don Cherry a senator under Harper, I know it was probably rumor, or maybe he was testing the waters, I don't know. I, like, even in 2016, Tim, I, if Bernie was the guy, even four years ago, I would have voted Bernie. Yeah. Now, he's gone way left to the point that no borders, no walls, no USA at all. That's radical, radical leftism. I wasn't that guy then, but so I've shifted to center right. And you're right, the labels... They just won't take the labels off you. And I, th I think your dad's probably not suffering, but been labeled as well to the point of like, you know, it doesn't matter when you see the guy, what he's done right, who he's praising, who he's criticizing in their eyes. That's it. You're, you're a uh, xenophobic. Or what have yeah. 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 There is. Like, like, like I said, like I've been saying that it's in, 
it's it not only happened in social media. I mean, you know, looking back over dad's career, there's been guys that who consistently have attacked dad in the newspaper, you know, the Bruce Dalbigan, who was a reporter from out West. I think, you know, he made his career out of writing bad things about dad. I mean, and that's, you know, specific Rosie Domano um, in Toronto star. She, if she wrote an article about that, it was usually a, a negative. There's guys in Montreal. Um, so that there's always kind of been that out there. I think that, you know, there are people who don't like you and you're going to do nothing right for them. Um, but I just think in the social media aspect that, you know, it's expanded to people who don't have a, never had a voice and, and they have delusions of grandeur to think that they have a voice. Um, just get, get it out there more. So it, it, it becomes more of a mob mentality. Whereas before it was just in the mainstream media, you know, that, and, and I asked that, I says, does it ever bother you that, you know, that, that, you know, Bruce Dalbing and a Rosie DeMano or Jack Todd are right stuff bad about you he says no he says if they start praising me he says then i know i've done something wrong <laughs> <laughs> agree do you do you feel like there's a war on masculinity tim i mean we're seeing a lot of left-wing ideology you know um you can't criticize certain religions you you know there's 75 genders there's all this whole um uh, you know feminism seems to have risen to a point where they're making waves and, and trouble for, for men, I think, and, and boys. I, 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 do you think that there's a, like, I look at your dad, I look at my father, and I go, there's a strong, traditional family man who's traditionally masculine. He might, you know, back in the day, they used to say things that were inappropriate because, well, because we didn't, we weren't as evolved, and we get better every day. And I, I keep trying to point to these radical lefties, like, this is the most tolerant society we've ever known. We're more accepting. We're more tolerant we're, than we've ever been. Like, and we're yeah. getting better every day. And you can see as words start to go out of off bounds, like you can't say certain words now. And I grew up with these words. And when I see my boys that don't care and we play cards, you like I get jokes, sexual jokes about my dead mother. Everything's free game. Forget your nationality or your sexual orientation. Everything's up for grabs, and that's just the way boys are. So, do you see a little bit? Do you see a war on traditional ma masculinity? Um, I, again, I, again, I, I just think it's um, you know looking at it again from from a point of view of, of looking at dad. I, again, I just think that. To just there is the lack of tolerance or the lack of of middle ground you know what i mean like it is if you don't um, um it, it's it's kind of it is kind of complicated i mean dad is a very like you say he's a traditionalist um you know he doesn't like to swear in front of women uh he still believes that uh no oh, he's a big in that like he that drives him nuts in fact he used to go to certain um uh, banquets um but he stopped going because he didn't like the way the guys were swearing and there was a lot of women that were uh either in the panel or were working it and he, you know and some people would say that um you know oh well that's terrible uh that you think a woman can't handle those those words but on the other hand there's people saying oh that's terrible that you, those guys are swearing in front so a lot of it i think is it's it's just perspective of of what to do now you know, like, and I think, it, I even think from a feminist point of view, like I have a daughter who's 22 years old. Um, you know, I think from her perspective, um, and uh, I got, I was divorced and, uh, and so, I, and I was kind of raising her for a few years by myself. She was getting a lot of mixed messages on feminism. You know, what is it to, what is it to be a, a, a woman? And uh, she got a lot of mixed messages. And I think a lot of times she was confused. So I, I don't know if it's attack on just masculinity or is there just so many mixed messages out there of what is right and what is wrong. And, uh, you know, a lot of times she would ask me and I would say, you know, Grace, I don't know what to, I don't know what to tell you. You know, I don't know what to tell you, you know, and, you know, some of the things that she felt were important to her didn't matter because some of the feminist classes that she was taking in school were saying that's not important to you or shouldn't be important to you. So, right. you know, a lot of, there's a lot of mixed messages out there. And for the young people, it's, it's tough for you. Boys growing up 
what to do. You know, do you have the traditional role of opening the door for women? Don't swear in front of women, you know, uh, you know, be a, almost a protective role when you're with somebody. But a lot of feminists would look at that and saying you're demeaning to women when you do that. And there's other women saying you have, you should be doing that. So it's, yeah. it's gonna, it's a confusing world for young boys and girls right now. I appreciate your thoughts on that too. And it, it, I think we have to remember, and I've said this many times before on, on previous broadcasts, that the extremes are really out on the ends of the bell curve. Mm-hmm. And there's so few in numbers, but it seems like the ideology in the, in schools seems to really be left wing. Like, I mean, it's like, it's like reporters. They're all Democrats in the States. You've got one conservative news channel, Fox, and all the rest of them are liberals and they all belong. And it's the same with the teachers and the artists in Hollywood. They're all lefties. And like I said, my first election was 1993. I was laughed off the, the street when I was going for signatures. But now, Green Party, environmentalists, all, all these ideologies, this is trendy now. It wasn't trendy in 93 when I was 24 years old. So I think that the messages are, you're right, and then there's attack on, on both sides. And I appreciate you saying that because I really haven't considered that, you know, I'm a boy. I only see things from the boy's angle, but you're right, especially if you have girls, you're like, no, they're telling the, the, telling the girls too that, you know, it's not acceptable if you don't have a job. Like, what, a traditional mother uh, taking care of the house and, and raising children's not, like, I mean, this is what women were designed for is to give birth. Whether you want children or not, that's up to you. I'm not telling you, you need to have kids. But I think the majority of women want them. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's it, you are, you're right when you say it's, it's a different day. It's a troubling day, but I think that, you know, we've never had it so good. And I just like to see a little bit more gratitude now and then, I think, <laughs> it's anything. Anyway, yeah, um, I think it, um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that you know, a lot of we have a lot of people knocking the United States and you're knocking Canada, and our, and you know, we're we're very lucky to be living in these in in Canada, and the United States. It's uh, it's a good time to be in in these you know in these countries when you look at some of the uh, you know some of the the circumstances that other people are living in. What was it like growing up in the in the Cherry household? Was your dad absent a lot because of his travel and coaching? And his, well, I don't know. Did, did he have you guys when he was playing? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, well, with sister, um, it was uh, uh, my sister and my mom and dad moved fifty two times when he was playing in the minor leagues, and. Um, so dad was the hockey really was the family um you know when my mom would go to say uh from my mom was uh, from hershey pennsylvania and then they went to springfield mass and then they went to three rivers quebec you know the, the hockey team became the family the wives leaned on each other the kids played with each other um and then when i came in the family had settled a little bit more we'd settled in rochester new york and dad played there for 11 years and then i think i moved about 10 about nine or 10 times. Um, um, but dad, you know, the, my mom raised my sister and I, for sure. Um, dad was gone quite a bit on road trips and, and um, you know, he would work uh, in hockey. He would work, uh, you know, in the, he'd be, play winter in the hockey. And then in the summer, uh, he was a construction worker. And then um, when he coached Boston, uh, he still, the money was good, but uh, it was a lot better than he was used to. Uh, but still, he, he had hockey schools. He did stuff this summer to supplement his income. So my mom was the person that raised my sister and I, for sure. Um, dad was always the rod that if we didn't behave, that uh, we would have to deal with. Um, but but dad, dad was, you know, one of the people that would, uh, you know, his, uh, you know, he would, he taught my sister and I a lot about, you know, what is right and wrong. And, and how to make the right decision has made it that whatever the decision is the right decision is the hard decision and the decision you don't want to make. And um, so, and, um, and he never pulled any punches. He does always, and my mom were always supportive in everything that my sister and I, you know, went, but um, 
uh, dad was, I wouldn't say he didn't have a filter, but he was, uh, if something, if we were doing something wrong, he would not hesitate to tell us that we were doing something wrong. You mentioned you had a kidney replaced too. Tell me about that. How long did that put you down? Yeah, I was, uh, and that would have been back in 1978. I had, uh, what they call, um, post streptococcal nephritis which is basically an infection after an operation, after I got my tonsils out. And it um, uh, damaged my kidneys if the kidneys weren't working. And uh, I was on dialysis for about six months. And then uh, luckily my sister was gracious enough to donate her kidney. Uh, we were in Boston in 19, so it had been 79. And I had a kidney uh, transplant back then. And knock on wood and praise the Lord that all has been good since then. So, uh, uh, yeah. And it's, um, so that's something that's always been near and dear in our heart. And it was interesting when, um, David Ayers, the guy who played was the Zamboni driver was the emergency backup goalie for beat the Leafs. Uh, he had a kidney transplant about, about 15 years ago. So, um, you know, that was, you know, that was something growing up that, um, you know, I think shaped my life, gave me perspective. Um, when things are going wrong, I look back and I say, well, things could be a lot worse because I've been there. So, um, uh, and, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, my mom and dad, my, especially my mom, and my, my dad would even say this, but my mom was a driving force behind the family when I was sick back then. So uh, it was a time that you don't forget, but, um, you know, I've been very lucky since then. How long since your mom's passed? Uh, she passed away in 1997, so it's been uh, it's been a while. I mean, she was um, uh, you know in her in her you know in her early 60s, and you really don't I, I you really don't realize how young that is till you're in your mid 50s. And my, actually, my sister now is a year older than when my mom passed uh, from from cancer. So um, again, you, I think looking back at it now like just how young my mom was back then when she when she passed my mother was 61 as well does cindy ever hold it over your older sister ever hold it over your head that you've got one of my kidneys <laughs> no uh, she used to when we were young uh, right after it i mean luckily she was a little bit older she was 18 at the time so i think uh, i think probably mom and dad told her don't do that uh, <laughs> behind that body but um no, I, I've always been, I've always been grateful. And, and Cindy and I have, have uh, when we were younger, we didn't have a very good relationship. Well, I used to say it was a typical older sure. sister, younger brother relationship, but um, we have a good relationship now and we're, we're pretty close. Actually, we're a close family. My, my dad doesn't live too far from me right now. He just lives maybe about a two minute walk from my house. Mm -hmm. um, and my sister lives maybe about five minutes away. And I mean, that's the one thing about doing, nice about doing the podcast is that, you know, we do it Sunday morning. Um, we do the two shows. We do the Monday and then we do the Thursday both on Sunday morning. Then afterwards, we have lunch together and we should have the microphones on then because I think it would be more interesting than what we talk about sometimes. And then, um, and so it's nice to have that time with dad. Um, you know, I've been very lucky. Uh, I scout for the Ontario Hockey League and dad goes out to a lot of games with me and we spend a lot of time together, uh, especially the last couple of months, going to rinks and watching all the young, up and coming superstars. And um, so I've been, you know, I've been lucky and I've been blessed having the podcast and been able to spend time with dad. Um, looking back, because not being able to spend that time with my mom because she passed so young. Yeah, that was my next question. I, I saw the picture of you and Cindy and Grape sitting around the kitchen table. I, I don't know why. I, I'm probably not like. Um, unlike many people, I just feel this connection, this family connection to you guys. Like you could be distant relatives or, you know, somebody I grew up with or whatever. So that, that one picture of you guys sitting around the kitchen table was, was awesome. But uh, who, who are you looking at these, uh, these, Oh, is he coming to Comic-Con Niagara Falls or did that pass? My dad got all excited. He says, yeah, Cherry's coming to town. He's coming in March. You should get him on the show. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah, I think he is. I I got the date here. Okay. So, um, but you don't know, like we don't know, like uh, with the whole coronavirus oh, thing, we don't know what's right. going on. So mm -hmm. you know, they you know, like they've, uh, you know, I don't know if you heard, they suspended the NHL today, and they they suspended basketball, and um, and um, so uh, um, 
you know, we don't know if they're, if they're still going to go or not, but we'll have to see. But if it all, all going ahead, yeah, he's, uh, he's got a couple of friends that live in that world and they've been bugging him endlessly to go to one of these things like for decades. So finally dad had no excuse because they always say, Oh, it's playoff time. Oh, it's in the middle of the season. And he always can make an excuse in the summer. Oh, I'm going to the cottage. So now he didn't have an excuse. So all right, it's finally get all these guys off his back. He's going to do one. So, who's um, his buddies so he's are, looking forward to that. Who's, who's are, who are his buddies that are hanging out at Comic-Con? <laughs> Seems like two different worlds. Um, well, he's, uh, yeah, yeah. It's um, uh, Hirsch Bornstein from Frozen Pond and okay. dad and Hirsch go way back. So, uh, um, and do a lot of, uh, dad does a lot of signings for him. And, and if dad has, uh, say he has uh, somebody that needs some charitable stuff, sometime Hirsch will give dad to give for the charitable stuff. So they always been, they've been friends and there's connections through there. So they've been always been, Hirsch is saying, I got so many guys that want you to go to Comic Con, and then you know, it gives me the contact, and Dad's no, no, no. So now that, so now Dad doesn't have an excuse. <laughs> so, uh, so he, he's should be interesting. He seemed to really take this whole thing in stride, and and I, I, I just love his grace and um, generosity. You know, he doesn't get down in the mud like he, I think he probably easily could. And and please tell him for me. He always apologizes when he goes off on a tangent. We love tangents. Get get sidetracked and go down those roads because those roads are all the really interesting story. You know, when he's sticking to the script, we're like, ah, yeah, I like it. Because he, he's like, oh, here I go again. And he'll, you know, drive around yeah. for a little bit talking. But uh, how has he handled this whole thing? And well, has he picked up any new hobbies or anything like that? What's he doing with his time now? Not too much. As they say, he's... Well, the one thing with that, with the, with the podcast is dad's all his hot, like he's, he's still very much an amateur when it comes to television and radio in the sense of, uh, he doesn't maybe quite get a lot of the nuances of it. And when he, when he did Coach's Corner, he had seven minutes. And then when he did the radio show, he had three. So now I'm telling dad, I looked at, we, we got to fill in at least a half hour, if not 45 minutes. So dad for 30, 40 years, however long he's been in TV was always go, go, go. I got to tell this story in a really short period of time. So now I'm saying, take a breath and give more of a story. So that's why sometimes I jump in to say, like, where were you? What have you yeah. been to? Maybe try to get him down those tangents because his, you know, his whole life has been, you know, I, I got to hurry up and I got to tell this story. But, um, you know, hobby wise, not too much. I mean, he, he, he as you say, with the hockey, he's been, you know, it's, I, I scout for the Ontario Hockey League and the GTHL or in the Greater Toronto Hockey League. And so he's been going out to me, going out with a, quite a few um, games. We've been, uh, I think, we went out four games last week we went out and watched. So, he, you know, he goes out and he loves watching the kids. I mean, that, that really is his is kind of sanctuary he just loves going out and watching the you know and, and it is really great hockey it's different hockey than the national hockey league it's a lot um the kids have a mentality of go 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 and so it's a higher pace than the national hockey. i mean comparatively speaking you know hockey players are faster than 15 year olds but the pace of the game i think is a little bit faster and um, so he's been going out and he really enjoys watching the kids and, and interacting with the families and taking pictures with the younger kids coming up and stuff like that. Cause I mean, you know, we joke long before well, this all happened with Rogers that he says, you know, two years, once I'm off TV, nobody will know who I am. And uh, so I think he's enjoying as daddy says, maybe this might be my last hurrah for a couple of years. <laughs> Well, I got to I got to be within ten feet of him and maybe waved at him. He he was down here in St. Catharines with the Ice Dogs, I think, and mm -hmm. a girlfriend of mine used to work for them, and I, she was she's still a friend of mine. But she um, she was just going out the door the other day. I'm like, hey, I got Tim Cherry coming on. She says, I said, who's Tim Cherry? I'm like, Don's son. <gasps> I love Don. He's such an icon. You know what I mean? And uh, I think that I don't know. I wish more people would have. A little bit of space for people to just say what they think it doesn't you don't have to agree with them just you know give the guy some credit for standing firm and i think he's done that and that was displayed 
I think very well with his stance with Rogers. Like, no, I don't know what they asked him to do, but he was just, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know, and Ron thought it was okay to do that and God bless him. That's every, every man for himself. But yeah, I think there's a, uh, there's a lot of hostility. I don't read all the comments, but even on uh, the stuff that I've been using of you guys on my channel, yeah. there's no uh, shortage of uh, vitriol is that the right, right word for Ron yeah. McLean? And I think Ron's a pretty decent human being. You know what I mean? I don't know him, yeah. but yeah. you know he made a call. And but there's a lot of people pissed off in him, boy, because <laughs> they they really feel like he threw Ron uh, that he threw Don your dad under the bus. So I mean maybe well you know I, I as I say I, I you know Dad kind of doesn't like doesn't says you know let's just let the dust settle and we'll, we'll, Dad says maybe he'll talk about it some you know later later down the line. But the one thing I'll say about Ron is I, I just feel that the way it was handled, you know, Rogers didn't do Ron any favors and it put him in a, in a, in a, I think a very tough position. And, um, you know, I, you, you know, dad and Ron have been working together 30 years and, you know, dad always, dad always says, you know, he knew it was going to end badly. They knew there was going to be a train wreck. Um, and when it came, that, when it came uh, and I knew it was coming when dad said it, I said to my wife, this might be the beginning of the end. And we went to uh, New York and uh, we went to New York and um, ironically, we were at the uh, reflecting pool of nine 11, putting our poppies on. And my wife got a message that her, you know, dad was fired. And just to show how social media has changed things, um, my daughter's living in Spain right now and she's teaching in Spain. And within a minute, she texted me and said, is this true that Papa got fired? Wow. And so you look at how social media has changed things and how things can go viral. And once the genie's out of the bottle, there's nothing you can do about it, right? And, and how quickly it, you know, how quickly it happens. So. Uh, but I, you know, it, it's tough for dad and, you know, and, and Ron and, you know, I hope at some point that, you know, they, you know, they have some closure together anyway. Mm, I do too as well. Now tell me something, Tim, and, and be honest. How can you have a second dog and give him the same name or her the same name as the first dog? Did he name his, the, the, he's had two blues? Is that right? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. I had a, I had a bull terrier named Blue. And <laughs> I'll tell you why it was because... You know, when dad would go out, um, he doesn't do too many public appearances anymore, but he used to go with public appearances. And every once in a while, they would say, could you bring your dog blue with you? Mm -hmm. So he had, he had an older bull terrier and I had a younger bull terrier. So the younger bull terrier could go out and we'd call her blue just so the dog wouldn't be confused. And I call it, but then when dad stopped going, I got another bull terrier and called her pal. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, but he did that just because, you know, sometimes he would do, uh, people would go out, like he, he did a, a bull terrier walk for the Kidney Foundation. So all the bull terriers would come and then they had like an ugly dog when dad would bring dogs. So it was just easier bringing and getting another dog and calling them blue <laughs> instead of confusing the poor animal that your stage name is blue, but your real name is Buddy. You know, so. That's awesome. Tim, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for your generosity. Uh, give your best to uh, my father, uh, your father for me. And, uh, yeah. well, and I appreciate it. And, you know, again, thanks very much for, uh, you know, pushing the, and promoting the, the podcast and, you know, it's a lot of fun for dad and Cindy and I and my, my nephew Dell. And, uh, you know, as I say, we just enjoy kind of, you know, doing it Sunday morning and then having lunch and, you know, we start at 10 and I think by the time everybody leaves, it's two o'clock. And so we, you know, I, I think my sister and I will look back at this time and say, you know, we were lucky to have, um, to do this, just to have some time with dad. Yeah. Well, I hope he lives forever. Now, Dell is Cindy's son? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, we, I didn't get that. I, 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 I appreciate that you, you know, your father started mentioning, oh, and we got Dell here too. <laughs> I didn't yeah. know the connection. Yeah, though. He does, yeah, he does the technical stuff. He he took some he took a course in television at Mohawk College, um, but it that's a tough business to get into. And he decided that um, he wanted to get into a trade, so he's uh, he's a uh, he's going through the apprenticeship to be an electrician. 
So I said, you know, you'll be making more money than all of us in a couple of years because everybody needs electrician and everybody needs a tradesperson, right? So, um, so he he does that, but he still has a good head for technology. So he comes, and it's good that, and I think Dad likes spending time with Dell because, again, how many grandparents spend a you know a, a you know a, once a day with their with their grandchildren? Yeah, no, it's great. All right, Tim, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, brother. I want okay. to keep you on time. I've, I've kept you long. I could talk to you all day, but I, want to be, I don't want to be a pig about it. And maybe we'll get you on in a couple months if you've got something else you want to share. And, uh, and like I said, I hope your dad lives forever. He's, uh, I think he's a, a role model for many of our youth. And he certainly loves the kids, man. You can never take that from the man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for having us. And, again, thanks for pu pushing the, uh, you know, yeah. promoting the uh, podcast. You're welcome. Lots of love. To the family. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Cheers. Let me stop this thing. <laughs> I'll get it. I'll get it. Okay. And the meeting. There we go. See you, Tim. Thanks again. Tim Cherry, if you need him, uh, of the podcast. Um, Don Cherry's Grapevine podcast. Derp. Uh, you can find it everywhere. You can find it on my channel. You can find it on Grapes' channel. Um, Tim, Ch oh, I forgot to ask Tim what his background in video was. It was in uh, TV, or TV or movies or whatever. Anyway, we're working on a new set. As you can see, I've got a new background uh, only because I changed the set around, and we will have uh, a new format coming for you very soon with less jitters in the interviews. And uh, more of the style of, you'll see my desktop and you just see a little picture of me like down here in the corner, down here. And then the rest will be desktop. So we can talk about the news and then uh, you don't have to see my big squash filling your whole screen. Like, subscribe, comment below. Thanks to Tim Cherry for the time. Much love, brother, and I am out. End.